Hello and welcome to the next in our series of lectures on the larynx. Okay, for this lecture I'm going to be talking to you about the intrinsic muscles of the larynx. Now the larynx, as you know from Sean's video, has two main functions. One is to act as a sphincter to stop that um, food uh, particles which are going down my pharynx to end up going down my airways. Which that's very, very important. So it's a guardian of the airway. Um, and remember the word sphincter comes from sphinx which is that story of the Sphinx, which is the animal which was half human, half beast, stood on top of the rock outside the road to Thebes and um, used to give people who were passing by riddles. Okay, It's a cracker riddle and the people that have to get the riddle right in order to be able to walk past with their life intact. Otherwise, if they got the riddle wrong, the Sphinx would strangulate them. The Sphinx strangulated them, um, they would die and they would not be able to pass. So, the purpose of the Sphinx was a gatekeeper, a control of what goes through, and that is the purpose of the larynx to control what goes through. That's where it gets its name and those muscles, the sphincter muscles. The second function of the larynx, which is the one everybody else seems to know about, is the larynx as a voice box, so for phonation, producing sound. That's like an added advantage, the, the sound, um, when we get that function. So you remember the primary function is to act as a sphincter. So, you will also remember that um, Sean told you about the, this mechanism here, which is this elastic cone. What's this mechanism here? The elastic cone. Now, the elastic cone is quite special because what it does is it's going to bend in towards that midline, bend inwards towards the midline. As it bends in towards the midline, what happens is this. Air is coming up from within the middle of these two vocal ligaments. Okay, It's coming from the trachea upwards towards you, like that, into the camera. Now what happens if I blow air and pretend to be the lungs blowing air out out of this tube, which is a trachea, so <gasps> that air is going to accelerate down at a rate of knots. It's going to get to the cone, the elastic cone. That's my elastic cone there, the conus elasticus. And it's going to come in. And that air is coming up to the cone, <sighs> blowing against the sides. It's going to be channeled in to these two strings. And it's going to go through the middle of these two strings. And then suddenly, what have I got? Let me spin around to the screen. I've now got vibrating strings with air going past them. This is a musical instrument. And that's how sound is produced in the larynx. Okay, so that air is coming up and <sighs> coming at you vibrating, vibrating these strings as it as it's leaving the larynx area. So let's talk about some of these muscles. The, the muscles can be easily divided into two components. We talk about muscles which are going to affect the length of these vocal cords. So these are the vocal cords which are going to go from the thyroid cartilage up to the vocal process of the retinoid cartilage. So there are muscles which are going to affect how long this cord is, okay? And um, the length of the cord determines the pitch of the sound that's produced. So if my cord is long, I'm going to get a higher pitch sound, okay? So when my cord does that, if I just hold these together, because this model is not entirely accurate in its movements, if I just hold these together, when my chords do that, so really stretch out, I'm getting a higher pitch sound. No! Whereas if I bring my chords in, which I can't do here, but if I, if I bring them in so they are not so stretched, I get a low pitch sound. Bom! La! Now, which two muscles are responsible for that? Well, for my high pitch sound, if 
we look around here, I have a muscle which goes from my cricoid cartilage to my thyroid cartilage on either side. Okay, That is my cricothyroid muscle and look what happens when I tilt the thyroid on the cricoid at this joint here which is the cricothyroid joint which is a synovial joint this is what this muscle does it's going to contract from there to there <clears throat> and tilt that thyroid on the cricoid cartilage and as that happens if we look inside I'll hold these originals together so they don't misbehave there stretching stretching of the cords so that's going to produce my high pitch sound. Now, if you look here, I have another set of muscles running from my thyroid cartilage to my arytenoid cartilage. Okay, thyroid to arytenoid. This is thyroarytenoid muscle. Thyroarytenoid. Now, thyroarytenoid muscle is very special. It's got two parts. It's got a part which is made up of these fibers here. Okay, so it's lower fibers, and that is thyroarytenoid muscle proper. Okay, then I've got the part which is at the very top edge, on either side, very top edge, and that is vocalis. Now the purpose of thyroarytenoid is to contract and then reduce or shorten the length of this cord. So when this muscle contracts from there to there, it's going to reduce the length of this vocal cord. Now, thyroarytenoid, which is the, the bulky bit at the bottom, that's going to cause coarse contraction. So quite big movements. Whereas vocalis, the fibres on top, are going to cause very fine minuscule movements. Very fine movements in contraction. And that can vary your pitch. So you can get different sounds quite close together and quite unique sounds, very important for singing, and I won't sing for you just now. So those are the two muscles which affect pitch. The other muscles are all involved in the determining the size and opening of this glottis. Okay, this is the glottis, and these muscles, they encircle the glottis and determine what size this becomes. So let's, let's have a walk around here. So if we start from the front, we've got a muscle, which is going from my cricoid cartilage, swinging around onto the muscular process of the arytenoid cartilage. This is cricolateral cricoarytenoid. And then, if I go onto the back here, I've got a muscle which is going from the muscular process of the arytenoid cartilage onto the laminar part, so quite a wide fan spread onto the laminar part of the, of the cricoid cartilage at the back. And this is posterior at the back, cricoarytenoid muscle. And then the same thing happens on this other side, right round to lateral cricoarytenoid. What I also have here is this set of muscles which run in between the arytenoids. They are made of two components <coughs> and it trades under different names actually. In some books you'll find it's called the interarytenoid muscle because it goes in between, like inter, in between, like intercity trains. In some places, it was, it's called arytenoideus, arytenoideus muscle. And in some places, it's named by its component parts. And the component parts are, one, two, the oblique muscles, so the oblique arytenoid muscles, or these ones just going straight across. You see these fibers here? Straight across, transverse arytenoid muscles. So two parts. Great. Now when these muscles contract, what they do is they're going to bring these, bring the arytenoids together. So remember the arytenoids are quite special. Okay? 
they, when they're sitting on top of the cricoid here, they have several movements. They can either rotate, so which means they can sort of they can swivel about on their own axis, so rotate like this on their own axis. They can glide to the side or they can rock backwards and forwards as in rocking on a chair. Okay, so what we now have is this muscle lateral cricoarytenoid when it contracts it's going to bring these two vocal processes of the arytenoids together so lateral cricothyroid contracts so it's going to pull in that direction in that direction is going to twist this whole mechanism inwards okay and that's going to effectively close the glottis close the glottis you've got posterior cricoarytenoid this is the only abductor and opener of the glottis because when this contracts what happens here is you get the swiveling movement and it opens up the glottis The other muscle I need to tell you about, which is not visible on this particular model, but I shall show you shortly, is a muscle which runs along this quadrangular membrane that we mentioned, along the quadrangular membrane, and it runs from your epiglottis to your arytenoid cartilage. Okay? That is ari, ari epiglottic muscle. Ari epiglottic muscle. And it is claimed that thyroarytenoid comes round here and curves round and then becomes ari epiglottic muscle so thyro arytenoid ari epiglottic okay so almost continuous up the way and that muscle is going to be responsible for bringing the epiglottis down towards the arytenoid. So let me just show you on another model here, and you've seen this model before. If I lift this off, this is my thyroid, thyrohyoid membrane, hyoid bone. I lift that off there, and what I now have here is the cricoid, the signet ring, the trachea. What I'm going to do is this is my epiglottis here. If I pretend to be the um, epiglottic muscle when I pull down I close I close the airway but I don't close it perfectly I leave this bit here at the back which is open so my pea soup can get down if I'm not careful so what we do for that is that's where the interarytenoid muscles they're the oblique they come into play and they're going to squeeze these arytenoids together and hopefully seal that space squeezing these together. And this will then allow the food which I've just eaten in my mouth to head down. It will try to go there, but the door's shut and it has to go down the esophagus. So I'll just show you that on the picture here. So here is the ari epiglottic muscle going from the epiglottis down to the arytenoid. Okay? And that's going to conclude our section on the muscles.